Good day, everyone. My name is Father James Wallace. Along with Fathers Francis Gargani and Philip Dabney, we welcome you to this Holy Week retreat, Walking in the Darkness, Living in the Light of Christ. We are Redemptorists, and we're speaking to you from our home at Holy Redeemer Provincial Residence in Washington, D.C. We work as a team in a ministry that focuses on evangelization and adult faith formation. We will focus today on our experiences of walking in the darkness. Please join in our opening hymn. Loving God, 
as we move from the darkness of winter to the light of spring, help us to bring to completion this season that began with ashes and ends with alleluias. Be with us through any darkness we encounter, trusting in your abiding presence as we await the dawning light of Easter. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came and morning followed, the first day. Our first reflection this morning invites you to think about your experiences of darkness. I don't know how you feel about the dark but I still have a childhood memory of being afraid of it. I took great comfort from a little night lamp next to my bed, its soft glow pushing the darkness away, an impressive little bulldog peering into the darkness, keeping guard over me. But as I grew older, I became aware of different kinds of darkness than the darkness of night. In her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, Barbara Brown Taylor, a wonderful preacher and writer, offers a list of what she sees as darkness. She writes, Darkness is shorthand for anything that scares me, that I want no part of, either because I'm sure I do not have the resources to survive it, or because I do not want to find out. The absence of God is in there along with the fear of dementia and the loss of those nearest and dearest to me. And so is the melting of the polar caps, the suffering of children, and the nagging question of what it will feel like to die. Perhaps you have your own listing of what darkness is, memories of past experiences and different feelings associated with darkness. We're going to consider several types of darkness. Let's begin with natural darkness. This darkness is a part of daily life, part of the rhythm of our lives. Darkness giving away to light, light giving away to darkness. As we just heard from the book of Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw how good the light was, and separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, and morning followed the first day. Now notice, God does not banish the darkness, but integrates it into creation. Light becomes day, and darkness night. Darkness is part of the natural movement of the world, and of life in the world. And on the positive side, darkness helps us sleep at night and to rest during the day when we darken the room for a nap. There's also the natural darkness that comes with sickness and aging. <laughs> Over time, as we all know, the body weakens. Eyesight and hearing lessen, as does ease in walking, in reaching. Knees and hips need replacement. A friend once said, when I was 18, I didn't think at all much about my body. Now I have a doctor for every part. In time, we all know the body wears down. And then there's mental diminishment, lapses in memory, forgetting names, places, dates, and other things. 
Author Frank Cunningham, in his wonderful book on aging called Vesper Time, speaks of living in the hereafter. He writes, more and more often, I go back upstairs into another room, arrive there, and ask myself, what am I here after? <laughs> All this natural process, part of being human, suffering the wear and tear of time, with it comes a growing awareness of time running out. Friends, family, spouses, even children die. At some future time, the darkness of death will come. We all pass on. All these experiences can be put under the heading of natural darkness that comes into every human life. St. Teresa of Avila reminds us, all things are passing. God alone remains. Now a second kind of darkness can be called transitional or temporary darkness. It's called transitional because it can change, pass away. We're going to consider now three kinds of transitional darkness. The darkness of ignorance, the darkness of fear, and the darkness of grief. Now the first kind of transitional darkness is ignorance. We can define ignorance simply as not knowing being in the dark. It is why we put so much effort and finances into education. For the very meaning of education is to be led out of, namely, out of darkness, of ignorance. The very purpose of education is to give us knowledge about things, people, events, life, so that we can also develop a deeper understanding, empathy, and even wisdom as we go through life. Hopefully we develop skills for our livelihood and professional lives, but also skills in living in harmony and peace with all others, with all of creation. Obviously, the darkness of ignorance can have serious consequences. Ignorance leads to Failure in taking care of oneself, whether it be as simple as diet or exercise. Ignorance leads to failure in our human relationships, not knowing others, especially failing to take the time to know our family or friends can have disastrous effects in our personal lives. Ignorance of people around us, in our neighborhood, let alone in our world, can lead to a failure to appreciate other people, other cultures, races, or religions, such ignorance often leads to misunderstanding, alienations, and even seeing the other as enemy to be eliminated. And this not only leads to a lack of appreciation for the gifts, but often leads to our limiting what they're allowed to do. This has been a part of the history of the world regarding women, just to name one example where in many places of our world, women still do not have access to education, their gifts never appreciated or developed. Education of the mind, heart, and spirit delivers us from ignorance. Now the second kind of transitional darkness is fear. There are all kinds of things to fear in life. Fear of the future, what it will bring in terms of sickness, like. COVID-19, or fear of losing one's job or home, fear of war, especially a nuclear one, and fear not just for ourselves, but for our loved ones, our country, our world. As the great spiritual writer Henry Nouwen once said, fear can take up a lot of our energy and our time. And then there's the fear of natural disasters, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes drought, flooding, wildfires, the fear of what climate change and global warming means for the world in the coming years. And in a world of division like we have recently known, fear of others continues to deepen in many hearts. Fear of people of a different color, different culture, different race, different religion, and different political party. 
any of these can harden into a us-them division. And this can find expression in prejudice and violence. Mm -hmm. Does anyone doubt that fear is one of the causes of this country's racism that has proven so costly over the centuries and caused so much suffering in the lives of people of color? And isn't it fear that often prevents us from moving outside our comfort zone and going to the margins of our society to help those who have been pushed there? Such fear leads to more walls, more barbed wire fences, and more cages. So we have a choice before us to look at life through the lens of fear or a lens of hope. Hope in God, who has brought us to this point in time. God, our creator and source of all good gifts. Hope in Jesus, who promised to be with us until the end of time. And hope in the Holy Spirit, who provides what we need to live in love, because it's love that casts out all fear. The third kind of transitional darkness is grief. Grief can threaten us when a sudden loss comes, or an expected one, such as the loss of a loved one. They say that grief is a wild ride. When the loss of a loved one, or a relationship, or even a job inhabits your soul, you are in occupied territory. To try and resist it is futile. My sister Margaret died in 2010 by suicide. More precisely, my sister's bipolar disorder killed her because sometimes a mental illness is fatal. She was 61 years old. She was thrust into the deepest depression of her life. I remember she told me at Thanksgiving that she was not worth the chemicals that made up her body and that she was a burden on the universe. Three weeks later, she ended her pain by ending her life. It's been 11 years now and my grief continues, but my grief today differs from the first few year, years of grappling with her death it's not that time heals all wounds, but time and my freely sharing my grief with others has mended the wound enough that I can experience life now beyond her suicide. It feels like what once was an open wound is now a scar. And occasionally there are emotions that still show up uninvited, sadness, loneliness, anger, and regret. The difference between then and now is that now they are periodic and less intense. At the time of her death, these feelings were attacking me all at one time with vicious claws, or like five pound sledgehammers with nerve and never ending body blows that left me broken and unable to process what was happening to me. You could say I was going through the motions of living, but with the emotions of dying. Gradually, over time, with the help of God's grace and my own efforts, I moved from the darkness of my grief into the light where hope began to emerge again, and I began to live life a new. From the ashes of my grief, a deeper compassion was born for those who suffer from depression and loneliness. I found a greater courage to embrace people's illness and death. I also sense that Margaret's compassionate eyes sees them too. So bearing the cross of others is something we do together now. You know, we learn a lot more about life and love by coping with difficult times than by smiling through the happy ones. We do not have to create suffering. 
life will deliver it to us in many shapes and sizes. The Gospels say, take up your cross. That is how we learn, by cross-bearing, sometimes carrying our own and sometimes sharing the weight of another's. To sum up, the second type of darkness, transitional or temporary darkness, is a darkness that can give way to something else, even to light. It can be transformed, allowing us to move from ignorance to knowledge and even wisdom, from fear to courage and trust, and from grief to peace and hope. So let us now consider a third type of darkness, the darkness of evil and sin. This darkness can be called dangerous darkness, for it threatens the very life of the soul. <laughs> I can remember one of the strips in Peanuts where Sally says to Linus, can you walk me home from school? I fear the powers of darkness. Linus responds, I don't know if I can do anything about the powers of darkness. And Sally, well, how about a third grader who says I broke his ruler? <laughs> I smiled when I first saw this cartoon. But even in our day, bullying is a dangerous darkness for many children. Indeed, dangerous darkness is the darkness that is rooted in the human capacity for evil and sin. Joyce Rupp speaks of dangerous darkness as the darkness that lurks in situations where abuse, torture, or the destruction of another's life takes place. It is the darkness of violence, intimidation, and brute force that undermines and destroys life. End quote. One example is the darkness of prejudice that develops into a system of discrimination of others. Such darkness becomes embedded in systems of government and social life. Such darkness that manifests itself in racism or sexism or any other ism that excludes or limits others from the benefits of education or labor or health care or housing or any other social structure. It's a darkness we have experienced over and over in our nation and that threatens our very structures of democracy. Dangerous darkness is found in the sin of greed. Again, in our nation, we're dealing with the unfair accumulation of wealth by a small percentage, the 1%. While so many in our world barely subsist, so many are literally starving. Greed can also be found in Richer nations stocking up on vaccinations so much as four or five times what their population needs while poorer nations are receiving nothing. There is the darkness also of addiction. Addiction to opioids is one of the great killers in today's society. Though addiction in and of itself is not sin, its effects are certainly sinful. Addiction, by its very nature, draws us into ever deeper wells of darkness, often leads us to draw others there too. In this respect, we too often become servants of darkness, especially if we fail to confront it when we see it happening to ourselves or to someone we love. So much darkness flows from the reality of sin in our world, a darkness that consumes from within. And Jesus warned his disciples, hear me all you and understand. Nothing that enters from outside can defile a person since it enters not the heart but the stomach and passes out into the latrine. But what comes out of a person, that is what defiles. From within people, from their hearts come evil thoughts, and fornication, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. 
And that's from Mark chapter 7, verses 19 to 21. Evil can take up residence in us. Evil can control our hearts. The darkness of sin turns us toward destructive selfishness and self-centeredness and away from loving God and others. But no, this dangerous darkness of sin and evil, it can be overcome. Our faith tells us there's a greater power, the power of God's grace, of God's presence, can heal, restore, and even transform us. God's power can be known even in darkness itself, with darkness giving way to light as night gives way to day. Finally, there is a fourth type of darkness called redemptive darkness. This darkness itself can be healing. The poet Mary Oliver has a very poignant poem, only two lines. It's called The Uses of Sorrow. She says, Someone I loved once gave me a box of darkness. It took me years to understand that this, too, was a gift. Mm -hmm. Some experiences in our lives begin as a deep darkness and extend over a long period of time. Sometimes such experiences happened in our childhood or in our youth or young adulthood. Sometimes they're so painful that it would seem to be impossible to come out of them into any kind of happiness. But such an experience of darkness can give way to a new dawn through God's grace. Such darkness can even deepen a person, transform that person to be more compassionate and to be a healer for others. In his book, Barking to the Choir, Father Greg Boyle tells the story of Sergio, a young man who was both a drug addict and a gang member when he entered a recovery program that Father Greg ran. Sergio's early life was as close to a long stretch of darkness as you could imagine. As a child, he suffered a deeply wounding relationship with his mother. He tells how one day his mother said to him, Why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Sergio also tells how his mother drove him down to Baja, California, took him up to the door of an orphanage, rang the bell, and said to the person who answered, I found this kid, and she left him there. It took Sergio's grandmother three months to find out where his mother had left him and to come and get him. And Sergio told how his mother beat him every day during his school years. He said, I had to wear three t-shirts to school to stop the bleeding from being seen. His wounds embarrassed him. He never wanted anyone to see his wounds. And yet in the end, after discovering that another kind of life was possible, Sergio was able to say, once I was embarrassed to show my wounds. I didn't want anyone to see them. But now, how can I help anyone else to heal unless I embrace my own wounds? Sergio was a witness to embracing the darkness of his own wounds in a way that allowed him to move into the light and into a life of helping others to embrace their own wounds. Sergio's wounds, physical, psychological, spiritual, became a source of strength. And his scars continue to help change the lives of others. Redemptive darkness can also be experienced as holy darkness, a setting for encountering God. A darkness that is holy because one can find God there. Jessica Powers has written of her experience of finding God in the dark in her poem, The Garments of God. God sits on a chair of darkness in my soul. He is God alone, supreme in his majesty. I sit at his feet, a child in the dark beside him. My joy is aware of his glance and my sorrow is tempted to nest on the thought that his face is turned from me. He is clothed in the robes of his mercy. 
voluminous garments, not velvet or silk and affable to the touch, but fabric strong for a frantic hand to clutch. And I hold to it fast with the fingers of my will. Here is my cry of faith, my deep avowal to the divinity that I am dust. Here is the loud profession of my trust. I will not go abroad to the hills of speech or the hinterlands of music for a crier to walk in my soul where all is still. I have this potent prayer through good or ill. Here in the dark, I clutch the garments of God. Powers finds the presence of God in the darkness of her soul, clothed in the garments she can clutch. The mystics have often referred to the holy darkness as the dark night of the soul. We often think of John of the Cross, Carmelite mystic and reformer, great friend of Teresa of Avila, as the traditional source on the subject since he wrote extensively about it. But even in modern times, we know both Teresa of Calcutta and John Paul II, both now recognized saints, endured its challenge and reflected on its gift. For the dark night of the soul often occurs when you feel stripped of meaning and purpose, and the things that gave you consolation or meaning no longer satisfy. The terror that haunts you, it's the feeling of losing God. It purifies your soul from all attachments. It asks your soul, am I enough? Even without marriage or love relationships, without prosperity, success in your work, without any satisfaction or boost to your ego, is God enough? Freedom is the fruit of such purification, the gift of faithful patience during such holy darkness, and joy. No longer clinging to anything, you recognize everything as grace, but not grace you control or manipulate or necessarily possess. You are open to all the blessings God sends, and free to let them also go. The cross of Christ, the in unconditional love it represents, becomes everything. A God dying to love us is enough. Such freedom is the secret to living with deep inner joy. And such joy is the fruit of such holy darkness. So, as we bring this meditation on darkness to a close, we invite you to consider how you have known the darkness. The natural darkness that's part of life, the transitional darkness that eventually passes, the unholy darkness that can be named as evil and sin, and the holy darkness in which one clings to God, to Christ on the cross. Our God is with us in the light and in the darkness. So do not be afraid of darkness. Don't be afraid of it having the final word. Reach out for the one who does not abandon us, who will never turn away from us. Reach out for the Lord of light and of darkness, the good shepherd to whom we can say, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Psalm 23. So let us spend a few moments now reflecting on what we have just heard.
blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your I have tried you in fires of affliction. I have taught your soul to grieve. In the barren soil of your loneliness, there will I plant my seed. stood before the grave. Though my love can seem like a raging storm, this is the love that saves. Let us now call out in prayer to our loving God. To you, God of light and God of darkness, we cry out, dispel any destructive darkness with the light of your presence. And make us worthy of your gifts, especially the gift of creation. Save us, merciful God of all creation, that we may praise your holy name each day. Enkindle in our hearts the flame of your love. And make us long to be forever united with you. 
Your word is a light to our eyes. Let it strengthen those who trust in you. Remember those in our world who are suffering, those afflicted with the coronavirus, those who suffer from any life-threatening sickness of body, mind, or spirit. And deliver them into a world of justice, peace, and joy. Remember those who have gone forth from this world. Lead them into glory, promised to all who have come to know and serve you in this world. We pause now to remember our own intentions this day. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us pray together. Loving Father, let your glory dawn to lighten our darkness. May we be active in prayer and in deed. May we live out our calling to be children of light in our world, serving others and letting them see and know you by our words and deeds of kindness, compassion, justice, and forgiveness. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We thank you for joining us for this retreat. We hope you will have a blessed Holy Week and a joyous Easter. May the Lord our God bless you with peace. May the Lord our God fill you with his love. May he guide you and guard you. May he fill you with compassion. May God bless you and hold you. May he always be 